Hi, I'm Norma McDonald Ewing, and I'm pleased to be joining you for this webinar on risk management. Over to you, Jody. Thanks, Norma. And I too would like to welcome you to the risk management webinar. I'm looking forward to sharing some information and some of our both Norma's and my experience with you. Turning to our first slide, we have outlined our webinar outcomes. And we do have listed sort of the, really the what, the how, and the why. Moving on to our next slide, so just to start us off, we want you to think about one or two words that you would think would describe that term. So I'm going to give you just a moment to ponder that. So some of the, the things that you may have thought of is planning, the process that needs to, to take place, stopping accidents from happening, safety, some of those, those thoughts, maybe some of the terms and things that, that you thought of. One of the things that we want to stress is really looking through our safety glasses at all times to help us to identify what are some unsafe situations or conditions that may be present and what are some things that we can do to try and prevent those risks from happening. Over to you, Norma. Thanks, Jody. So when we talk about risk management and we talk about your role, we want to emphasize that your job is to identify high risks and activities that can be more risk-oriented. We want to emphasize that your role is to look at ways that we can minimize risk. We want to ensure that we're thinking of the rules that need to be in place for our participants. It is our job to ensure that we are supervising or the staff that are working with or for us are supervising the participants at all times. And then ensuring that we develop for ourselves checklists. So checklists that each day we can review. They may involve checklists that are related to the equipment on site. It may involve checklists related to the site itself. But these are ways that we can ensure that the participants and the site and the program are as safe as possible. Chance is something that when we're working in the field, there's always a chance and we have to be cognizant of that chance and plan for ways in which we can reduce the chance of risk. When we talk about chance, we then want to ensure that in a very intentional and purposeful way, we're leaving nothing to chance. So as we said earlier, our job as recreationists is to ensure that we are thinking about all of the things that we can do that eliminate the potential of an accident or an incident in one of our programs. One of the things that Jody and I want to share with you is the diagram in front of you. So when we're leaving nothing to chance, we are ensuring that there's rules and policies in place, there's procedures that relate to each rule or each policy that's in place, and we have a way of documenting those rules, policies, and procedures that make sense for the program that we're responsible for. When we talk about establishing rules and policies, we also realize that those rules and policies can be different whether we're working in the voluntary sector, the private sector, or the public sector. And we need to ensure that the rules and the policies that are, that are in place make the most sense for the sector that we're working in, the program that we're working in, and the participants that we're working with. We also want to ensure, moving to our second bullet point, that we have emergency procedures in place. We need to be planned and prepared for the chance of an emergency. And we need to ensure that all of the staff that are on site or involved in the program and all of the volunteers that are on site and involved in the program, as well as the participants, clearly understand in the case of an emergency, what is their responsibility. So it's our job as recreationists to ensure that we provide very effective, detailed training with our staff 
around emergency procedures, and that we also extend that training to the volunteers or who are on site. One of the things that Jody and I find as we work within the province is that oftentimes agencies have emergency procedures, but the staff, the volunteers, and the participants aren't as aware of the emergency procedures as they could be. We also want to be sure that we are recording, documenting all incidents and accidents. And it's really important that we do this in a very concise but very specific way so that we're acknowledging things like where on the site or where in the program did the incident or accident occur? What time did the incident or accident occur at? What activity was taking place when the incident or accident occurred? Who specifically was involved? All of the important and relevant details must be recorded so that you can review that documentation or if your agency needs to review that documentation or in a court of law if that documentation needs to be reviewed, it is an effective tool for providing information that relates to the incident or accident. We also feel strongly that not only do we need to record all incidents and accidents. Not only do we need to create that documentation, but we also need to evaluate after an incident or accident what happened. Could we have prevented that? We also need to evaluate could we have dealt with that in a more effective manner. So we really encourage you to participate in reflective practice. Let's move to the next slide. And in keeping with leaving nothing to chance, I want to share three more bullet points. The first being we must actively continue to identify potential risks. Sometimes we get a little bit lax. The summer's underway or the after school program throughout the year is underway. And at the beginning of the program or the beginning of this session, we've identified potential risks. It's our responsibility to, in an ongoing and intentional way, continue to identify those potential risks. Earlier, I mentioned the importance of appropriate supervision. One of our responsibilities is to ensure that for each specific site, for each specific program, and for each age group, we're providing the supervision that's, in, that's appropriate to that setting or to that population. We also want to ensure that we are doing our part as recreationists and we're encouraging our peers or our staff or our volunteers to do their part. So there is some training that's required around appropriate supervision. And we need to be, again, very intentional and purposeful as we explain and help others understand what are some key elements of supervision. One of the things that sometimes we run into at an after-school program or in a summer program is the staff develop strong relationships and are very interested in each other and what each other has to share and may become less interested or less focused on their role. So encouraging our staff, encouraging our peers at all times to be mindful that their very first and most important responsibility is to the participants in the program. Thirdly, it's important that we set safety goals. And this is something, again, that varies from recreation sector to recreation sector and from recreation program to recreation program. The goals should be set for specific programs and for specific sites. Let's move on. If participants are given the opportunity to participate in a program that is well planned, which is very diverse, which meets their needs, and they're actively engaged, then we reduce the opportunity for the risks. We're engaging them in a positive way and eliminating some of the 
perhaps behaviors or horseplay or other activities that could encourage incidents or accidents. We want to also look at our program design. And as recreationists, we know that a program design has several aspects. We want to be sure that in a program design, the participants are given an opportunity to fully engage, that the participants are well aware of what the rules for engaging in the program are. They're well aware of what they can expect from other participants and from the leaders related to that. It's a program that is designed with their age and ability in mind. And it's a program that is stopped while everybody is still enjoying it and engaged so that they want to return to that program at a different time. Jody, I'll turn it over to you and we'll go to the next slide because it's a neat way of looking at our role and responsibility is. Thank you, Norma. What I'd like to do is introduce you to what we are calling the accident equation. So here we go. The accident e equation is really a, a great formula or tool that you can use when you are doing your, Norma talked a lot about the benefits of having a good, pro a good solid program design. And a part of uh, developing your program design is really taking a look at what are some of the hazards. And what I like about this equation is it really breaks down the three different areas where there could be some potential hazards that we might want to give some thought to. And this, this, this equation can really be used in your planning process as a tool for brainstorming. What are some of the, p the potential people hazards? So let's take a, a closer look at each one of these hazards and what they could potentially be. So firstly, uh, the participant hazards, and we've listed some, some participant ha possible participant behaviors that could happen um, are uncaught, the, the participants could be uncooperative, maybe aren't really interested, or Norma talked about the importance of engagement and, and the participants being as engaged as possible in your plan. So that goes back again to the design and having ideas and having theme days and, and having some exciting activities that the youth and the children are really excited about participating in and then excited to come back for the next day. If that is happening, then there will be a less of a chance of the, of the participants being uncooperative. They will be excited to be there, more engaged, and there will be less act to be less things like bullying happening and horse playing happen. New to situation, and I think that's really important, and Norma again talked a little bit about how important it is that that staff participant relationship is built. And so, and, and right from the very beginning on the very first day is really trying to, it's really important that the leaders build a rapport with each of the participants in the program and get a sensitivity to what their interests are, what it is that they like to do, what their uh, characteristics are, are they shy, are they somebody that's a little bit more outgoing, and trying to, to work with that within the program. I think a lot of the participant behavior, behaviors under people hazards could, can be alleviated, alleviated through, firstly, the design and the exciting program that's put together, and secondly, the relationship that is built with the leader participant working together. A second area under people hazards that needs to be considered are leader behaviors. So really important that as peers, the leaders are working together, they're cooperating, they understand each other, understand each other's strengths and are building on each other's strengths. There may be one that is a little bit more uh, familiar and strong and, and comfortable with song leading, for example, and another one is maybe a little bit more comfortable with leading some of the more active games. So just understanding that and being able to play off one another is really important. And having some communication between leaders, and this is going to come up when we talk about our scenario, what are some of the strategies for communication between leaders and peers as the program is unfolding so that they can stay on top of what's in, on, a, on an ongoing basis, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and sometimes second-by-second -second basis, keep on tabs of what's going on within the program, within the, with the participants. And then lack of knowledge and skill, and that's where the training comes in, and it's really important to build on and take any opportunity possible to learn about uh, some of the areas that will build a, a really creative design, program design, as well as just knowledge of handling and working with some of the behavior challenges that may occur. 
So some of the behavior management training sessions. A third area that, that may crop up that we don't have listed on this slide around people hazards are uh, parents and some of the behaviors that leaders sometimes are having to work through with parents. And I think more and more parents in today's society are becoming really involved and being um, a real part of the program. So really honing in on the skills of working with parents, communicating with parents, and being sure that they are kept in the, in the know of what the plan is for the program and what's happening with the program so that they're feeling comfortable with the program design and the safety. So moving on then to environmental hazards. And some of the environmental hazards are equip equipment issues and some of the site design. And so it's being sure that it's you know, on a site, no matter whether it has playground equipment on it or if it's an open site, a field, or whether it's in a school or a community center, it's really important to do just a quick check before each program, each day that the program is being offered, just to look for hazards, potential hazards, and be sure the equipment is in good, safe conditions and that uh, they, if there was any repairs needed to some of the equipment, that the repairs are done. And the design, there's some thought to how your program design, you may have activity stations set up, and so how the activity stations are set up to ensure that there is a, a flow that, that considers some of the safety conditions. So if you have some more active activities going on, you allow the space that's needed for that activity and have it away from maybe a quieter activity so that they can, they can work well in harmony, in harmony together. Um, and then the weather, be having always, always your, your backup plan due to weather. So if you're planning a, a program and you're, maybe your theme day is to have outside kinds of activities, but then it turns into being a rainy day, which wasn't anticipated, being sure that you have a backup plan so that you can go indoors or have some other ideas put, put together to work through that. So be thinking about what are some of the potential environmental hazards that could pose a problem and then try to put the plans in place to ensure that, that it isn't a, a problem. And all of that really does equal an accident potential. So really taking a look at the potential and then putting those plans in place, which I know that you can really do. And, and again, that's working together as a team, back to that communication, working together, sharing ideas of what are some things that you can do to ensure that those potentials are uh, thought through and that there's a plan put in place. So I'm going to move on now and pass this back over to Norma, and she's going to share with you a bit of a scenario to give you some, some, some tips and some tools of how to be thinking about accident potential. Thanks, Jody. So moving to the next slide, the scenario that we would like to share with you and have you do some thinking around is a scenario that Jody and I experienced. Um, it's a scenario that occurred in a summer playground program, and although it occurred in a summer playground program, it could easily have occurred in any recreation program. So we like the scenario because it's very transferable to a variety of settings. In the scenario, what happened was there were two program leaders who were responsible for 24 children who ranged in age from 6 to 12 years old. As recreationists, you're very aware that 6 to 12 years is a vast age range and what a 6-year-old is capable of and what a 12-year-old is capable of and what the ages in between are capable of are very diverse. The scenario occurred at a site that was isolated from other uh, agency services and programs. And what happened was one of the program leaders took a six-year-old into the facility to use the washroom. This left a single program leader responsible for the rest of the participants, so 23 other participants ranging in age from six to 12 years, when a nine-year-old participant bolted from the activity area and bolted towards a major intersection in a city. So it was a very serious incident and the potential for accident was great. What Jody and I would like you to think about is, and, and while you think about this, we're very hopeful that you'll take into consideration some of the things that we've talked about in the webinar. So the concept of risk management, 
processes and strategies that can be implemented to reduce accidents and incidents, and the importance of communication and teamwork, the roles of the recreationist, the leader on site. Taking that into consideration, we would like you to share what you think the program leader should do. So it's the program leader who's now responsible for 23 participants while the other program leader is inside of the facility. So just sharing some of your thoughts. Um, we need to be sure that we're managing the participants and that we're keeping them occupied and ensuring their safety. So whether it's a volunteer that steps up and keeps them occupied or whether it's a parent or there's some other strategy put in place, ensuring that the participants, uh, the 23 participants are well looked after. Communicating quickly with the on-site staff and volunteers we spoke earlier about the importance of practicing emergency procedures and ensuring that everybody that's on site, be it a participant, be it a volunteer, or be it a staff member, is well aware of what happens during an emergency and what their role is. Communication can quickly occur when everyone's very clear on their role and their responsibility. And, and that segues into the third point about clearly assigning roles or duties to staff. So it's not enough to train around what will need to happen. We need to be very specific in creating a plan around who will do what during an emergency. So when a, an emergency proce procedure is being carried out, who is responsible for telephoning? Who is responsible for the participants? who is responsible for the emergency first aid. So ensuring that we're very clear on what the individual roles are in an emergency. As we talked about a little bit earlier, having a communication plan in place so that communication can easily be transferred from one person to another, relayed from one person to another, or from one agency to another, one site to another. Staying calm, one of the things that Jody and I have learned as we've done risk management training is that the challenge is ensuring that all of the staff involved stay calm, the volunteers involved if there's parents on site, and the participants stay calm. So it's really important that while we're working through an incident or while we're working through an accident, while we're responding to a situation, that we are doing it in a very calm manner. We set the tone. So if we can be calm and confident that there's a resolution that we're working towards, then the participants in the program and the volunteers and the parents will take their cue from us. Ensuring that we can call 911, so having a plan in place for who's going to call 911 and how are they calling 911. Are they using a cell phone? Do they carry a cell phone with them? Are they using a phone that's inside a facility? How do they quickly get to that phone? Is it a system, and in some agencies it is a system, where you must dial 9 first and then 911. So ensuring that the training is very, again, specific to that site and that program. We also want to ensure that we're consistently following the policy that's posted so that we are conducting all of the steps and all of the procedures that the agency that we're working with and for or the partner agencies that we're working with and for have outlined as important for us to adhere to. So ensuring that we can quickly turn to a posted policy and ensure that each one of the steps that we're required to follow through on, we do follow through on. 
It's also important that we contact our supervisor or supervisors immediately. So taking uh, that short period of time to make contact, to let them know that there is an accident or there is an incident, oftentimes they can quickly come to support that accident or support that incident and support the resolution of that. Not only do we want to contact the supervisors, but we also want to ensure we're contacting the parents where appropriate. So if it is the nine-year-old that ran or bolted from the site, we do need to speak to their parent quickly. Um, in some scenarios, we need to speak to multiple parents or all of the parents in the, of the participants. So ensuring, again, that we can make a quick decision and act on that decision quickly. Who, which parents need to be notified and how are we going to do that? We talked earlier about the importance of ensuring that we document in written form any incident or accident and that we do that in a timely fashion. So that's something that should be done very shortly after the accident or incident has occurred. And it's important that as a team we complete that information. So although one person uh, may be responsible for doing the actual write-up. It's very beneficial if team members are all involved in ensuring that all of the most pertinent information is shared and is documented. And we often can support each other. Something that I may not remember, Jody may remember. And when we complete it together, we get a fuller report. And moving on, so, Jody, now I am sending it back to you. Okay, thank you, Norma. Communicating with one another is our first point here. So communicating, as I mentioned earlier, is letting parents know what, what the plan is and, or caregivers what the plan is and who the, what the contact information is. That's really important. Um, communicating with each other, communicating with your supervisor, other contacts if you're in a school setting, the school principal, the school, cu school custodian, if you're in a community center, then the community center staff, the front reception staff, being sure that everybody, they are all a part of the team and being sure that everybody is in the know of what the plan is, have the contact information, and also what the emergency plan is. Secondly is emphasizing teamwork, and that's really where the role playing and the practice comes in, comes in play, is really taking a look at who's responsible for what, going through a role play and practicing that and emphasizing that you really are working together as a team. And it's, it's the leaders on site, but then a part of the team are also the supervisors, 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 uh, other on-site contacts, et cetera, that we listed above in the communicate section. And thirdly is being prepared. So really having a well-planned design, some really creative and exciting activities planned so that the youth are really excited about coming. And, also, and having that plan, not only having the plan in place, but also having everything there ready to put the plan into action. So it's one thing to have it on paper and have your theme ideas, but you need to have sort of a minute by minute idea plan of what you're gonna do and who's responsible for what, and be sure that you've got your supplies well in advance and on site ready so not a leader isn't having to go off site to go pick up supplies while the program is in place. And I think that's, that pretty much wraps up everything that Norma and I did have to share. And that's the end of our webinar. Thank, Thank you for you. your time.